and we can start the session right so the people are still joining now what was the previous lectures animal science Okay, today we are going to discuss about the sources of charges on the clays. How the sources are, I um, mean, the how the charges are developed on the clay minerals. I think in the last class we have uh, discussed about the last two or three class we have discussed about the classification of clay minerals. Am I right? Am I audible now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So we discussed about the uh, classification of clay minerals, right? So can anyone please simply classify the clay minerals? How it is cl classified? Ag is double zero two. Ag double zero two. Ag zero one six. Ag zero one six. Oh, any volunteers? Please tell me how to classify the clay minerals. AG one six eight one six eight. Please tell me how to classify the clay minerals. AG one six seven. Am I audible? Please tell me if you cannot hear me. Please tell me. If no one answer, I cannot continue the class. Right? Zero eight five. Ag zero eight five. Sorry, are you Ag zero eight five? Who is the batch rep? Please talk to me. At least batch rep, talk to me. Yes, ma'am. Am I audible for you all? Yes, ma'am. So why you are not answering? Huh? If you don't know the answer, you can tell me now. Zero one nine. Zero one nine. Yes, ma'am. So can you please classify the clay minerals? Okay, any volunteers? You don't have notes with you at least. So if you don't know the classification, then then it is difficult to understand how the charges are developed on these clays. Right? So we have to please discuss about that though. Any any volunteers, please, by looking at the notes, please tell me how to classify the clay minerals. Basic, it is very basic, no? Depending on the pH. pH dependent, pH independent. Now I'm asking how to classify the clay minerals.
yes. Uh, yeah, please tell me how to classify the TA minerals. You are telling about the what are the sources of charges, right? pH dependent and pH dependent, we didn't discuss so far. So I'm asking how to classify the clay minerals. Yes. Depending on that, we can classify. I don't hear you properly. Can you hear? Sorry? The arrangement of the octahedral and the tetrahedral sheet. Yeah, octahedral and the tetrahedral sheets. What are those? Organic and inorganic. Organic and inorganic colloids. Yes, good. Then how to classify the inorganic? Tell me the full classification, Paul. Uh, first, organic and inorganic colloids. Yes. Inorganic colloids classified layer silicate clays, mm -hmm. uh, iron and aluminum hydroxide, mm -hmm. and allophane and other amorphous minerals. Mm -hmm. And layer silicate in a divided one is to one type, two is to one type, two is to one is to one type, mm -hmm. two is to one type uh, classified expanding. Limited expanding and non expanding. Okay, okay, thank you. Yes, yes. Can you tell me the example? Examples for each type. One is to one example. Okay, good. Kyolinite is an example for one is to one type. Then two is to one expanding type. Vermiculite. Vermiculite, is it expanding or limited expand? Limited expand. Yes, limited. Then expanding? Smectite. Okay. One more light. One more no light. And then for non ex yes, the light, non-expanding type, two is to one? Uh, fine grain mica. Okay, good. Then other classification, please continue. Two is to one is to one. Example for two is to one is to one. Chloride, chloride. All right, any light, right, good. So now we are going to look at how the charges are developed on these clays, on the inorganic as well as the organic clays, right? Here, there are two major sources of charges. Okay. Yes. There are two major types of charges on the colloids. One is pH dependent charge and other one is the pH independent charge or the permanent charge. pH dependent charge means it will change with the pH. When the pH increase, the charges may change. Likewise, when the pH decrease, charges may change. Maybe create, it depends on the functional groups. Right, so it depends on the functional groups and the reactions. The, the charges are depends on the pH. Right, when the pH increase or decrease, the charges may be changed. Sometimes it may create a positive charge, or sometimes it may create a negative charge. So this is through the mechanism of ionization of the OH ion or through the protonation or the reprotonation of the H plus ion, right? And the pH independent or charge means it is the permanent one. It will not change with the pH. Whatever happens to the pH, whether it is increased or decreased, the charge will not change. That is actually through the isomorphous substitution. The term is new for you, isomorphous substitution, right? So there are two types of generally, there are two major sources of charges. One is pH dependent charge, that is maybe through the ionization of the OH minus ion, or through the protonation and the deprotonation, it is mainly depends on the pH. And the second charge is the pH independent charge or the permanent charge, that is through the isomorphous substitution. Understand? This is the very basic thing, right? If you understand this one,
Okay, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. So now you know there are two main types of um, sources for the charge development. One is pH dependent and other one is the pH independent, right? Now we'll see one by one. First, we'll see about the isomorphous substitution. How the isomorphous substitution creates the charges on the collides, right? Isomorphous substitution comes under the which type? pH dependent or pH independent? pH independent. Independent, right? When the pH change, the charge will not change, right? So we'll see what is actually the isomorphous substitution. You know, during the weathering process, what happens is the primary minerals dissolve and it's recrystallized and it just again forms the secondary minerals. Okay, so through this process, you know what are the basic uh, layers of the clay minerals? Building blocks of clay minerals. What are those? How the clay minerals form? Zinc and tetrahedral and the aluminum octahedral. These are the building blocks of the clay minerals, right? So during this uh, weathering process or the decrystallization process, what happens is one element from the tetrahedral or the octahedral may be substituted by the other element with the same size and the shape. So when it forms the new crystal, the size and the shape will not change. That is the isomorphous substitution. Here you see one element may become substituted for another element of similar size in the crystal structure without changing the shape of the crystal. That is the isomorphous substitution. If we tell it more technically, we can say that the process of replacing silicon in the tetrahedral. Tetrahedral means what do you mean by tetrahedral sheet? What do you mean by tetrahedral sheet? One silicon atom surrounded by how many oxygen atoms? Four, four oxygen atoms, four oxygen atoms, that is the silicon tetrahedral. Then the aluminum octahedral means one aluminum atom surrounded by six oxygen atoms, that is the aluminum octahedral, right? So here, if we tell that the isomorphous substitution more technically, process of replacing silicon in the tetrahedral, or the aluminum in the octahedral by other ions of comparable size. It means a similar size, more or less equal size, without changing the basic structure of crystal is known as the isomorphic substitution. Right? The definition is important. Right? Definition for the isomorphic substitution is important. That means the process of replacing silicon in the tetrahedral or maybe the aluminum in the octahedral by other ions of comparable size, important terms, right? Comparable size and without changing the basic structure of the crystals. That is the isomorphous substitution. Okay, so in case when it's substitution one ion from by the other ion, if those two elements or two ions do not have the same ion charges, for example, if we are substituting the aluminum by the silicon. So what happens? This, the charges is different, no? Silicon is four, four plus, aluminum three plus. There are charge differences. In that case, it forms the net charges. It creates the unsatisfied net charges. Okay? So that is how the isomorphous substitution develops the charges on the collides. Okay, if those two elements do not have the same ionic charge, 
then the unsatisfied net negative charge, net sorry, net positive or maybe the negative charges remains at the point of in the crystal. So that will create the charge. So here you can see that here this is the what is what is the difference between the dry octahedral and the di octahedral? Hmm? Any of you please? Di octahedral and the dry octahedral. Then the octahedral sheet having the three, what is the ion this? Magnesium ion, that is we call as a tri octahedral. That's when the octahedral sheet having the two aluminum ions, that is we call as the di octahedral. Right? Here you see the net charge is zero, right? This uh, six positive charges from the magnesium ions again the oxygen proves right oxygen atoms having the again three negative charges one is already occupied with this magnesium and it forms the three negative charges likewise at the side also three negative charges one is already linked with the, this uh, octahedral sheets right so the total ch net charge is zero Right? Likewise, here in the dioctahedral shape, three, um, two uh, aluminum ions are occupied. So here the net charge is zero. Six plus three minus three minus, three minus and the net charge is zero. When the isomorphic substitution occur in this dioctahedral shape, so that means one aluminum ion is substituted by the magnesium ion. Can you see this? Can you all see this? Yes. yes. Here, what is happening is isomorphic substitution is happening here in the di octahedral sheet. So, how it is? The one aluminum ion is substituted by the one magnesium ion. So, here it will create the five positive charges and again three negative negative charges. So, it creates the minus charge. Okay. So, the the, the valency is different, right? So that is what we create the net negative charge. Okay. So here, common substitutions are aluminum for the silicon, right? If we uh, substitute this silicon by the aluminum or aluminum by the magnesium. Or aluminum by the ion net negative charges. So you can conclude that. So the higher charges, if the higher charges are substituted by the lower charges, it will definitely create the net negative charge. Am I right? Silicon, aluminum, and the aluminum. These three, these are having the higher charges compared to the aluminum in the silicon. And uh, if we, if we uh, replace the aluminum by the magnesium, or if we replace the aluminum by the iron, so it will create the net negative charge. Understand that? Yes, ma'am. This is an example for that. Right? So this charge does not depend on the pH. Okay, we, we didn't think about the pH here. Okay, so therefore it is called as the permanent charge or the constant charge. <coughs> right? Understand that isomorphic substitution, how it creates the charges. Isomorphic substitution means it is the process of replacing uh, one element by the other element of comparable size. Right? Without changing the shape of the crystal. Right? If those replacing two ions are having uh, same charges, it does not have the same charges that will create the net charges. So it may be negative or maybe the positive charges. So if this substitution is vice versa, for example, aluminum for magnesium or silicon for aluminum, it gives the positive charge. That is how the, uh, the permanent charge is or the isomorphic substitution 
create the permanent charges on the collides. Right? And then exposed hydroxide groups or other functional groups on the surface of the clay with crystals. So here they can release or accept the H plus ions through the protonation or the deprotonation. It also will create the either positive or the negative charges. Okay, so this accounts for most of the net negative charges in the pyrolinite and some of the uh, charges in the monolinolite and the vermiculite and elite. And the broken oxygen bonds at the edges of crystals, at the broken edges of crystals, the small Al3 plus and the silicon's ions are exposed to weathering and may be lost. Right? So the remaining oxygen ions have unsatisfied net negative charges. This is an important source of the charge in the place. Here you can see how this develops negative charge. Right? And we'll see about the pH dependent charge, how the charges are changed with the pH. Okay. This charge is mostly associated with the collides such as humors, allophane, and the iron and aluminum hydroxides. Okay. You know, in the humors, the organic matter, humors means the ultimate decomposed product is the lead, humors. Right? So this may have the functional groups at the ed edges of the um, edges of the cycle, right? So here mostly the carboxylic groups are present. So carboxylic means CWH, no? So through the protonation of the deprotonation of this H plus ions, so it may create the charges, right? So here the hydroxide oxides, whether the crystalline or the amorphous, get their charge from the surface protonation and the deprotonation. Normally, the layer slickets have a small amount of variable charges because of OH at the edges. All the negative charges on the humus is variable, and the hydroxides are positively charged in, in some very acid soils and help to retain the anions. Here you can see. This is the aluminum hydroxide, right? So when the pH is increased, that means the OH minus increase. So what happens is this H plus will detach from the OH group and it forms the water and it creates the ALO minus negative charge, right? So some of the pH dependent charges associated with the carboxylic and the hydroxy groups. So the same thing happens here in the carboxylic group, CWH. So when the OH minus increase, so the, through the deprotonation, the H plus will detach from the CWO minus and it forms the water and it creates the net negative charge on the collide. Right? It is mainly in the humus rich soils. Right? If the soil is rich in humus or the organic matter, it forms the net negative charge when the pH increase. Okay, so normally this reaction is a reversible reaction. So when the pH decreases, what happens? The reaction moves to the left side. When the pH increases, the reaction moves to the right side and it forms the negative charges. Right? Here you see that under moderately acidic condition, there is a little or no charges in these particles. But as the pH increased, right here the pH increased, H plus from the colloidal OH group dissociate or and the results in the net negative charge. Right? The reaction is reversible. If the pH increase more or OH minus ions are at available to force the reactions to the right side and more charges on the collides, more negative charge. If the pH is lower, then the OH minus concentration is reduced, the reactions go back to the left side, okay, charges may be reduced. Okay, likewise, another sources of increased negative charge as the pH is increased, 
is the removal of positive charge complex in the aluminum hydroxide ions. Here you see, this is the aluminum complex aluminum hydroxide ions. <coughs> yeah, here the pH increased, that means the OH minus concentration increase. It, it reacts with this ALOH twice glass and it forms the ALOH thrice and it creates the ALOH twice minus negative charge. So this ALOH thrice is insoluble compound. Understand up to this? So when you go through the notes, you can get a clear idea about it, right? And we will see how the positive charge, so far we discuss how the negative charge is developed. Now we'll see how the positive charge are developed. So here you see the, the moderate to extreme acidic condition. So this ALOH thrice also dissolve, right, through the, by the H plus ions and it forms the positive charge. And remove the water. So when the excess of H plus present, again it reacts with that and ALOH Two plus it forms, right? But ultimately, it creates the through the continuous reaction, it creates the Al three plus positive charge will create. Okay, so therefore, if the if these ions are present in the soil, the pool of ions present in the soil, maybe the pool of functional groups present in the soil, the pH if the pH is changing. It may create, sometimes it may create the negative charge or maybe it may not create any charges at the intermediate pH level. At the meantime, it, if it is in the very low pH, it may create the positive charges. Understand? Up to this, please tell me if you are not clear so then I can explain it again. You can go through the notes again. So if it is not clear, you can ask me. Clear? Anyone please tell me? AG077. AG011. Understand? Yes, ma'am. Yes, you must know about the iso. Important thing is here. So everything is important. Mainly the isomorphous substitution. Right? This is it is much more important, right? So here, see if if it is. Uh, Soil mixture of humor, several inorganic colloids can contain both positive and the negative charges at the same time. Why? Because of the pH changes. Right? In most temperate regions, uh, regions soils, the negative charges far exceed the positive charge because of the pH changes there. Right? So, however, in some acidic soils, the topics in high in iron and aluminum hydroxide. The overall net charges may be positive. So if you understand how the charges is developed, how the positive and the negative charges develop through the changes of pH, okay, this is the basic. You can discuss anything, right? Yes, you can see it how the charges is developed and at what point it may create this. As I discussed earlier, when the pH increase, the net positive charges may decrease. Okay, you know, yeah. See here, in the very low pH, positive charge. What happens? The pH increase, the positive charge may be decreased.
Can you see the slides now? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Go through it. Go through the slides. And also indicating the relationship between the soil pH and the positive and negative charges here. How the positive and negative charges are changing with the pH. So the net negative charge. What is happening to the net negative charge? Net negative charge increase. That means if, we, if the net negative charge increase means the cation exchange capacity is increasing. Right? We will see what is cation exchange capacity later. Right? And the net, net positive charge is decrease and the pH increase. So that means anion exchange capacity is increasing. Right? Okay. And it's about the zero charge is about 4.4 or 4.5 pH. Okay. Are you clear up to this? How the charges are developed on the collides. There are two main sources of charges. One is um, pH dependent charge through the ionization of OH minus ions. And we discuss how this forms their positive and the negative charges. And uh, again, through the protonation and the deprotonation of H plus ions, right? That also we discuss how the uh, pH change these charges. Right, and creates the positive and the negative charge. And the second one is the pH isomorphous substitution. And you know what you mean by isomorphous substitution and how the isomorphous substitution creates the positive and the negative charges. Understand? Then we we'll move to the ion exchange phenomena. Right? Ion exchange. So there are two again cation exchange and the anion exchange phenomena, right? So the reaction between the soil and the weak solution of chemical is known as the cation exchange or the base exchange. Here you can see cumas or the clay collides having the calcium in their sites. Okay, understand this? This is the collides, okay, or the humus. Here, the calcium is present in their exchangeable sites. Okay? When we add the sodium chloride solution, okay, when we add the sodium chloride solution, what happens is this calcium is replaced by the sodium here. This calcium is divalent cation, sodium is a monovalent cation. So, if you want to replace one divalent cation, it needs the two monovalent cation because this is two plus, this is one plus. If you want to replace one divalent cation, it means the two monovalent cation. Understand? So this, calci this calcium is replaced by the sodium ions here. Right? Then this calcium will come into the soil solution. Understand? This is the cation exchange. This is the basic of cation exchange. Clear? Yes, ma'am. Yes. If the collide and particles is saturated with the calcium and when it's treated with the sodium chloride, the, the solution calcium can be displaced by the sodium ions. 
If you want to replace all the calcium in the colloids, we need more sodium chloride. And however, if the resulting calcium chloride is not removed from the solution, it would be replaced sodium from the exchangeable complex until the equilibrium is attained, whereby the colloidal particles would be charged with calcium and the sodium. Right? If you need uh, until equilibrium, until it reaches the equilibrium, the exchange progress may continue. Right? So, but if you want to replace all the calcium metabolites, we need more sodium. Right? If it is desired to replace all the calcium from the soil solid, the soil is enriched with the sodium chloride. <coughs> that is a simple thing. So then calcium is constantly being removed and has no chance to react with the soil solid to replace again. <coughs> that is the cation exchange. Cation exchange capacity means the sum of the exchangeable cations that the soil can absorb, that is the cation exchange capacity. Sum, total exchangeable cations that the soil can absorb. Okay, here the C is expressed as the number of moles of positive uh, unit for that cation exchange capacity, centimole positive per kilogram, or milli equivalent per 100 grams of soil. Okay, it's important, right? The unit of C is centimole positive per kilogram or milli equivalent per 100 gram. Okay? Wait. AG154 AG154 AG zero one nine. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, can you please tell me what is the unit for that uh, exchange capacity? How to read this? C mole plus Not kilogram. Mole. That is centimole. Centimole yeah. positive per kilogram. Per kilogram. Oh, milli equivalent per hundred gram. Oh, sorry. Okay. So here the C is, is due to the presence of a net negative charge which attracts the positive charge ions. For example, the positive charge calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, and the ammonium ions. These are the positive charges. Aluminum hydroxide ions, right? These are the positive charges. This is a simple calculation. If a soil has a CEC of 10 centimoles positive per kilogram. So that means the meaning of that is one kilogram of soil can absorb 10 centimoles of H plus ions. One positive, right? 10 centimoles of H plus ions. We exchange it with 10. If it is a monovalent cation, that is 10 centimoles. If it is a divalent cation, how many centimoles? Five centimoles. Five. If it is a trivalent cation, then 10 by 3. So you should understand the meaning of that. C is your 10 centimoles positive, one charge per kilogram means. So one kilogram of soil can absorb 10 centimoles of monovalent cation or five centimoles of divalent cation or if it is tri, 10 by 3. Trivalent cation. Okay. This is a simple calculation. I will upload the slides in the LMS. Please go through that. Huh? The CEC practical, we will discuss about the how to calculate the cation exchange capacity, right? Is it already finished? The cation exchange capacity practical. Huh? Please tell me whether you have already done the practical CEC. Yes. Huh? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. 
Yes or no? Had they an exchange capacity practical finished or not? Finished, ma'am. Finished. Okay, what is the basic principle of had they an exchange capacity then in the practical? What is the principle? How to do that? How to do? Simply tell me how to do the cathode exchange capacity. Any of you, please tell me. Repla replacing the exchangeable cations with ammonium acetate. Okay. First, you have to replace the exchangeable cations by the ammonium acetate. Right. Then. Then. When you replace the exchangeable cations by the ammonium acetate, what happens? Huh? Ammonium ions, NH4 plus ions, replace the cations from the soil collides and ammonium ions will present in the soil collides. Then you measure them how much of ammonium ions is present. So that is the total exchangeable cations. Okay, then you are measuring, ultimately you are measuring the total exchangeable cations by measuring the ammonium ions present in the collides. Understand how you are measuring the ammonium ions then? Hmm? How you are measuring the ammonium ions? How to measure the ammonium ions? By titrating. Titration? You have to do the gel dye method, right? Huh? Distillation and the titration. Okay? So here, this is simple calculation. 20 milligram of CH plus equivalent to the 1 milligram of H plus science. Right? So you know the basic calculations of uh, milli equivalent in the laboratory techniques you have already studied, right? Equivalent to the one milligram of H plus equivalent. That is equal to 23 milligrams of sodium equivalent to 12 milligram of magnesium ions equivalent to, this is the whole equals, right? So it's very basic, right? Equal to 39 milligram of K plus. If the soil can hold 50 milligram of Mg2 plus per 100 gram, calculate the CEC in milliequal. Can you please calculate, do the calculation and upload in the LMS, right? I will give you as an assignment this one, right? I'll upload the slides today. So do this calculation as an assignment and upload in the LMS, right? Are you all clear? Are you all clear? Yes, I will up again. I'm telling please do this calculation as an assignment and upload the LMS. Uh, assignments we will discuss in the next class, right? And then we'll see about the factors which affect the content exchange capacity. <laughs> Okay, what are the factors may affect the cation exchange capacity? So one is soil pH. Soil pH, type of collides, texture and the organic content. These four are the main important factors. Sorry, important factors. The soil pH, type of collides, texture of the soil and the organic content. Right? So, are you all clear about the cation exchange capacity? What do you mean by cation exchange capacity? Anyone please simply tell me what do you mean by cation exchange capacity? You have already discussed in the theory in practical also, no? What do you mean by that? Total exchangeable cations uh, in the soil. Yes, total exchangeable cations present in the soil collides. That is the cation exchange capacity. 
And so the unit of cation exchange capacity is centimol positive per centimol positive per kilogram and O milli equivalent milli per equivalent per hundred grams of soil. Right? So this um, this cation exchange capacity depends on the soil pH, type of colloids, texture, and the organic. Now we'll see how the soil pH affects the cation exchange capacity. Okay, here the cation exchange capacity of most soils increases with increasing the pH. Okay, when the pH increases, the cation exchange capacity increases. Yeah. So, See, when the pH is at capacity increase, it is increasing it. Understand? The EC of the more soils increase with increase are developed so that the cadenic exchange capacity is increasing. Okay. So at very low pH, few cations can be placed, and the majority of the colloids have H plus and ALOH twice the signs on the soil. So this held so tightly, okay, if the low pH means the concentration of H plus signs is high there. Okay, so if it is high, so it will held this H plus and this this ALOH 2 plus ions so tightly, therefore it resists the exchanging of cations. Okay, so therefore CEC is very low at low pH. Hope it is very difficult to understand every, everything together. So can you all understand this? How the pH affects the cation exchange capacity? Any doubts up to this? I'm going to stop with this. It is, it is somewhat difficult to understand. Any doubts? Are you all clear? Yes, ma'am. Okay, then I will stop here. So you have to give me one more hour, right? So additional hours. So you are, I think the last two, two hours. Two hours you have to give me. Last Friday also we didn't take your lectures because of your request. So you better give me additional two hours other than your uh, scheduled time, right? The bank ship, it is for your consideration. You have